Uh, Dr. Gordon is uh, head of the uh, Gordon Medical Group in New York. She is a board certified general surgeon, but she, she specializes in hormones and menopause actually. And she has been called on duty to uh, the front lines uh, of this COVID-19 pandemic. We did an amazing broadcast a couple weeks ago that got a ton of views, but we had Zoom problems. So this time I wanted to bring her back and I'm using a different platform and I'm able to broadcast onto Facebook Live as well as um, YouTube to give her the attention uh, that she deserves for being on the front lines. Um, she's dedicated the last month of her life and putting herself at risk as well as her child and family at risk, um, taking care of these very, very sick patients. And it's my honor and privilege to bring back the amazing Dr. Michelle Gordon. Hi. Yay! Give it up for Dr. Gordon, everybody. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much for so, having me. Uh, no, first of all, I just want to say it's Gordon Surgical Group. We're not a we're, we're not a medical group. Um, oh, it's a surgical okay. group only. That's okay. And um, uh, yeah, and so. Um, you know, you're, it's it's not surprising that you called it Saturday because it's quarantine days. <laughs> you know? That's right. You're getting yeah. lots of love and thank yous. And uh, I just want to here. And um, yeah, man, we're, we got 700 years. So let's let's go into this. That's great. Um, yeah. Last time you were here, just you're in Westchester County, right? I am. Right yeah. An hour north of uh, New York City at a little hospital relatively, but you guys normally run five to six uh, ventilators at a time. Five and to six, five to seven, you know, I mean, we have a 10 bed ICU, 10 bed mm -hmm. PCU. We usually don't have any vents in the PCU. Yeah, and uh, give us an update. You were already so vents uh, last time. W what's it like now? Yeah, so we had 34 vents uh, when I talked to you a couple of weeks ago. Um, our uh, the highest number of events I'm pretty sure was around 50 something. Um, and then we got some help from the community hospitals in the area and we got some help from the comfort and we actually shipped out patients and we're down to 20, 21 events now, which is still a lot. Um, we, what we ended up doing was we had our PACU, which did not have individualized rooms. We had turned our PACU into that's post anesthesia care units. So the post-op people, um, were being treated as a um, it was it was as another ICU, uh, and then what they did was they took the amp surge area, which had more individualized rooms, and put up like um, makeshift doors and things like that, and and that became um, a, another ICU. And we actually had a doctor down there uh, that was doing it. Um, you know, taking uh, care of that, that area. You said something kind of controversial last time, which was that. Um, Everyone on the vent ended up dying. Do you have, um, is it the same or have you? It is you not. We've had, we've been able to successfully extubate a couple of people. Um, and that was just my experience. And I understand that that was controversial. I said, you know, I said a couple of things that were controversial. I said that, uh, I mean, I say a lot of things that are controversial. That's just me. But uh, I said, you know, you die alone. Uh, everyone dies alone. That's, I mean, it is hard, I think, for, um, for the families of people who are really, really sick, uh, because they're not able to be there, um, mm -hmm. and because we don't want we don't want them to get um, to get sick, exactly. you know, as well, you know, and it's just it's just not a good place to be. Um, but in terms of like what we saw, we were seeing most people on the vent were dying, and still, when you look at the numbers, um, uh, and I, I I like to look at world worldometer. And of the closed cases of coronavirus in the whole world, uh, that's about 715,000 people. 21% of those are resulting in deaths. And it's still 4% is serious or critical. Um, so in terms of our, of our um, mortality rate, you know, I think our mortality rate in the U.S. is somewhere around 2.6%. I haven't done the numbers in a while. I haven't, done, look, haven't looked at the numbers. About three percent. New York is like four percent. So yeah, New, New York has gone up, but you know the UK was the last time I did the, the math was about twelve percent. I mean, it was really That's bad right. there. Yeah, they're so, and Italy's even higher than that. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, we have to respect this virus. We have to respect the fact that it will kill us, and and the fact that that we've you know followed the shelter in place, and we we follow. You know, we you and I both thought that we'd have a million cases in the U.S. by um, last, you know, last week by Easter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we're seeing that that's, 
not quite happening. I mean, we're behind now because we're doubling now what about every eight days instead of every four. So Very staying cool. home has helped, washing our hands has helped, um, but it still kind of sucks. And I know that there were some riots in Lansing. Well, let's talk about that real quick um, and not to get too political, but uh, President Trump yesterday announced a plan to open up the economy again. What, what are your thoughts on that? Listen, I, 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 um, I don't get involved with that. <laughs> I mean, here's here's what I think. I mean, my understanding is that China tried to open things up and had a surge. Um, my feeling is that probably a lot of people went to um, see people on Thanksgiving. I mean, they, on Easter, and um, with that, we're, we may see. A, I think we should wait two weeks and see because we. I think we're going to see another surge, and I kind of think that as we as we reopen, we're going to see more and more surges. Okay. I want to get back to reopening, but you just opened that door. So I just thought I'd take that question. But um, yeah. I want to talk back about ARDS. Um, there's been, mm. since we last talked, you know, I did that video about how we die, how yeah. part of our skills is ARDS. But since then, there's been a lot of hints that this ARDS is slightly different, including this microthrombolic event inside the artery of the lungs. What do you know about that? Is that what you saw in the ICU? What's happening there? Yeah. So what we were seeing is we were seeing a lot of these people that required uh, hemodialysis and, and so they needed, you know, artificial kidneys. Um, a lot of them were having clotting problems. And we saw, we saw a lot of that, you know, we would put in the dialysis catheter and then the catheter would clot. And, um, and, and then we'd put them on heparin and, and a lot of those people, once they get to dialysis, you know, they don't, they don't survive, but we have to try. Um, what we think the mechanism of action is, is the, um, what's happening is we see a lot of inflammation and then we see people who have pre are predisposed to endothelial damage. So people with uh, underlying heart disease, erectile dysfunction, uh, diabetes, anything that causes uh, microvascular disease is um, susceptible to endo endothelial dysfunction. And then with the cytokine storm, we get a bigger uh, inflammatory response. And that's we've seen this uh, over and over and over. And so there's there's a few trials that are going on about, you know, I've read about um, either heparinizing or using love and I mean, you don't want to use love in, in kidney di disease. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's a really difficult problem. I mean, the disease is really fascinating because do you think, do you, do we do don't think, know anything about it. <laughs> these surgeons, we're going to have to take, take the lead. One of us is going to take the lead. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I'm just saying, you know, that's it. Do you yeah. think that, do you think the clotting problem is secondary to sepsis or is it something innate about the coronavirus? You know, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, the thought is that it's the endothelial damage and the, 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 the whole, you know, we, we've seen that permissive, um, you know, per, permissive low O2 in these patients with nasal cannula and, and uh, negative pressure room and, and prone, right? So we don't intubate them. We just let them, let them have low O2 and, and some of them uh, will get better. Oh, you froze on me. I lost my show. Oh, there you are. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Um, Dr. Gordon, you froze on me. Shoot. I don't know why. They shut I us down, Dr. Gordon. They shut did? us down. Who shut us down? Oh, no. You can't hear me? On I'm, my screen, I'm okay. Froze. Oh, there I'm, you are. I'm here. You're I'm here. here. I got I'm you. here. <laughs> I'm hardwired. I'm telling you, I hardwired because I was having so many problems with Zoom. I hardwired myself. Okay. I might need to so, do that. I got your back. Yeah. Right. We have... Believe it or not, we have over 1,200 people watching, which is amazing. Oh, that's great. Hey, everyone. Yeah, hey. And so do us a share. Give some love to Dr. Gordon for being on the front line. Uh, yeah. What were you talking about when I lost you? So we were talking about um, about the, the endothelial damage, and we're not sure. And we're talking about how fascinating this disease is for us because yeah. we don't know anything about it. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, that's, what's so really interesting about it is it's, it's just a really, I mean, from a standpoint of, you know, a medical standpoint, I mean, you must find it to be fascinating too, when you read about it. Well, I, and honestly, I'm just kind of glad I retired. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've been putting a ton of lines, you know, the, these people have, yeah. um, you know, they, they, they do have some, 
uh, some really serious problems. But yeah. one of the things that we're yeah. noticing is that th there was a randomized COVID-19 trial and uh, hydrochloroquine did not give any benefit. So let's talk and about that real quick. So hydroxychloroquine and a z pack do you think that's helpful? Prevent, like, where are we with that? Well, I mean, I haven't, nothing, nothing I have seen uh, has changed the, you know, what I know and that what, you know, that, that as an outpatient, it may work. Uh, but by the time you make it to the hospital, you're probably not going to, it's not going to help. Not going to help. Yeah. I, I yeah. put that too, that we didn't really have any good studies or conclusive evidence that hydroxychloroquine and z -Pak was helping people in the ICU. And that I got a lot of negative comments about that, which I Yeah, it's I, it's not. I mean, the, the yeah. biggest the biggest studies are now with the, the new, um, I think Gilead's drug, Remdivir, I think is how it's said, how it's called. And that's, yeah. that's actually giving some... Um, HIV drug, isn't it? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't treat HIV. Right. I just, I yeah. just, you know, I've been reading a lot about, about COVID and treatments. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so do, you think, do you think that, um, it's a good idea for people to go and start taking a hydroxychloroquine and no, and it and, no. well, let's not, let's not forget <laughs> that, that there are side effects, you know, whenever we're doing, whenever Problems. we're doing any sort of treatment as physicians, we have to do a risk to benefit ratio, right? Risk to benefit. And, you know, we, we have to weigh each one of them. So I don't know if you can see me, but I'm like trying to weigh, you know, weigh say, scales, right? And um, if the, if the treatment is more <sighs> harmful than, the, than, than, just letting things run their course, then, you know, we don't like to do it. Right. I mean, that's, that's one of the, one of the problems with cancer treatments, they can cause a lot of problems. And in the same case, you know, hyd hydroxychloroquine and um, Zithromax can both call, cause heart problems or torsades. And that yep. can, that's an arrhythmia that can be fatal. Mm -hmm. Well, let's jump right into it. Then is the treatment worse than the cure? Do you think uh, shutting down the country and, uh, causing this economic crisis. Do you think that was uh, worth the cure or the treatment was worse than the disease? I'm, I'm a surgeon. I'm not an econo economist. I mean, you know, you're asking me all these politically charged <laughs> questions. I know it's a little, but you know, we all have friends whose restaurants and businesses and stuff yeah. being and, and employees and lost yeah. jobs. Yeah. No, my, my business was affected really badly. I mean, we lost revenue and we've, you know, um, I, 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 I mean, I think there's, there's, you, you can see both sides of it. Yeah. Anybody trying? who's lost, anybody who's unemployed or lost a job, we really feel for you because we, you know, medical yeah. assistant, uh, all the, the hospital workers, we really feel for anybody. But do you think the treatment was worse than the disease? And what do you think? Um, you look, I mean, if you do the math, right. It, it, let's say we get 80% penetrance of a disease that kills only 2% of the population. 80% penetrance of a, th you know, 300 million people. I mean, I have to do that. I have to, I can't do it on my head. So I mean, I'm smart, but I'm not that smart. So we've got 300 million. Yeah. 200 right? million. Yeah. Right. Yep. So that's 4.8 million people dead. Mm -hmm. And by staying home, we've flattened the curve to the point that, you know, maybe we'll get to 2 million cases in the U S now, remember, we're not testing. We don't, we're, you know, we probably have already gotten to 2 million or 3 million cases. It's hard to say because there's a lot of asymptomatic, asymptomatic people out there. And again, we won't know until we truly understand how this virus works, its whole mechanism of action, what it does, we're not going to know the complete penetrance at all. But the fact that, you know, people, some people get really sick, but they, you know, and, and, and die or, or, you know, get better. Some people are like not symptomatic mm -hmm. at all, but are carriers. And that's what makes this such a scary disease and why I think it was right oh, to tell people to stay, to stay at home. There you go. So do you think that, um, everybody should be tested? If it's, if, if it's, a, <laughs> yeah, it's a big glass. of. I, I drink like five of these a day. <laughs> Um, so not vodka, everybody, not vodka. This is not vodka. vodka. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> what time is it? It's only one fifteen. So do I think everyone should be treat tested? I think that if we can get a cheap enough test, um, then, and it's an, and if it's an antibody test, then yeah, you know, we might want to consider it. And 
you know, when you think about the mechanism of action of coronaviruses, um, you know, we have a short amount of immunity and then we can get reinfected. Um, that's the common cold, right? That's how the common cold works. So uh, if we could turn the coronavirus into a common cold or if we can get antibodies that work, um, I think that that's going to be the treatment. You know, most of our vaccines all come from antibodies and antibody the problem treatment. Is right? it's, it's more deadly than a common cold. It's 10 to 100 oh, times deadly. So absolutely. I want it to be a common cold. I think I want it to be more like chicken pox where you get vaccinated and, and you're cured. It's a different type of virus, though. It's a, it's a coronavirus. It's, you know, the it's chicken pox is not a coronavirus. Correct. Yeah. You know, that's that's the problem. And and I don't so we don't know. I mean, we're seeing, you know, just just today, um, we're seeing we can get a positive test that can follow negative testing. You know, after they somebody's been negative, they can be positive. And I think that the, the Koreans saw that. And I think we're starting to see some of that, too. Yeah. Well, we know that the test itself is only 70 percent sensitive. So there's 30 yeah. percent missing. We're waiting for the antibody test. I mean, I think we've just ordered some and we're just waiting to start doing it as an outpatient. And I haven't tested myself, but I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that I had it. I, I was feeling pretty crappy. And I mean, I never had a fever, but I was like, you know, short of breath. And I was, I took an inhaler a few times, wasn't able to exercise. I had one night about a month ago, I had about a 12 hour period of chills in the night. And, and I felt it like coming on at 6 p.m. And I have a crazy strong immune system and I just felt weak and I had chills. Mm -hmm. um, Erica tested me for fever. I didn't have a fever, but uh, the next morning I felt it break during the night and the next morning I felt fine. But I'm pretty sure that was probably coronavirus meets the Asian immigrant immunity <laughs> system. And I won. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah, I'm curious to see too, because then Erica got sick. My girlfriend got sick and she was sick for about a week. Uh, and she's recovered from the and she said it was pretty, she felt really like crap. Yeah. Sure. My cousin was really, really sick when I was with her. So yeah. it's, yeah, I think, I think it just hits different people, different ways. You know, if, if you have a, like a, you know, if you lost your sense of taste or smell, then mm -hmm. you probably have gotten it, um, you know, plus minus, um, well, 1400 people watching right now. Thank you so much. Okay. For Thanks for coming on everyone. Coming uh, on. Robert <laughs> asked me, have you seen the blood type as a factor in death rate? No, I, that's not something we track. Oh, this is Dr. Gordon. <laughs> What's that? Oh, I, I, I'm, I look, I, you know, listen, I'm a podcaster, you know, if you want to, you know, get a really, we got the menopause movement podcast. And so I, I always look for questions. I got a question for you a little bit. Controversial. Yeah. What do you what do you think about that video that, that sort of went viral from that uh, e that uh, doctor in New York who who said this was like uh, high altitude sickness and that we're treating these patients wrong and not ARDS and stuff like that? Well, I think we don't have the data. I, I think we don't have the data. I mean, like I said, when you give high flow o nasal cannula O2 in a negative pressure room and you allow the people to have low O2, um, you know, some of them get better and some of them don't. Um, and remember, we we're we're taught to work from an algorithm, right? I mean, we have a we you know we're we're surgeons, but you know even the critical care guys, we all work from, you know, if this happens, then that then do that. If this happens, do that. And we've got a cookbook, and this mm -hmm. virus is brand new, and we have no cookbook for it. And so we're going to treat ARDS just like we treat ARDS. We're going to see, you know, we're treating it like we see it, and. You know, we're seeing some people are getting barotrauma, so an injury to the lungs from the ventilator and needing chest tubes and things like that. But that happens with ARDS, too. And so mm -hmm. it, it's an ARDS-like picture, but it's also pneumonia and it's also sepsis and it's also this whole cytokine problem. And so there's a lot of physiology that's involved there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about giving, uh, did you guys give IV vitamin C for these critical ill patients? Or did you see if it made a difference? <laughs> we ordered it, but we, I don't know that we really give it. We, we haven't, I mean, and, and some of the studies, some of these anecdotal cases show, you know, IV vitamin C plus an antiviral have really helped people. Um, and we don't know whether it's the IV vitamin C or the antiviral. And so um, in our, in our case, I mean, we're a small community hospital. We don't do as, you know, many protocols and, and, you know, the whole system in New York was really overwhelmed. 
But I have to say that it's really getting better. I mean, the, you know, the governor has said that the number of uh, admissions have gone down. We're still seeing, you know, 600, 700, up to 800 deaths a day. But it's um, we are seeing fewer people in the hospital. I feel like you've peaked then. I hope so. I, I, we're going to see, you know, Easter. I, I, I really do think, you know, people probably got together for Easter. And mm -hmm. so I think it's going to be another yeah. peak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd be, you know, you think bi bimodal or, you know, peaking distribution, some sort of a curve that goes up and down, up and down. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. But, but I mean, the, the infectious disease doctors that I've talked to have said vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc uh, are all, you know, things that you want to take. But just remember, if you're going to take vitamin D, don't take more than uh, 5,000 units. Yeah. Well, what's the deal with zinc? Why is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, I don't know them. I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I know that zinc helps. I mean, if you think about, um, you know, coldies, you know, uh, taking a little bit of zinc when you have a cold. So my my guess, and this is just a purely a purely a guess, it, it keeps the virus from entering um, entering mm -hmm. into the mitochondria. Uh, it, it, it said that um, zinc somehow helps the functioning of a hydroxychloroquine. But uh, I know yeah, it's a healing, and I know you need some zinc for healing and uh for like healing skin incisions and stuff like that if you have poorly healing wounds right so there's some with that too that's excellent yeah we well we we prescribe zinc at 220 milligrams for two weeks max uh for people mm -hmm. but you know remember in wound healing it's it's a fa factor of nutrition and vitamins as well and so sometimes you have to increase the protein intake and you make sure they have vitamin c because you need the vitamin c for the collagen cross-linking but um but in in this in this instance i think the zinc is more protective i mean i'm you know i'm taking over the counter zinc like twice a day because yeah. i have so, to go to the hospital so it's almost like voodoo right <laughs> so other than other than social distancing and staying at home, which we know works, if you had a yeah. friend or loved one call you and say, what can I do to stay healthy? What would you tell them? Uh, wash your hands. Um, wear a mask when you go in public. And, um, you know, like, you know, if you're going to wear gloves outside, right? Remember that any surface that you touch then is contaminated. And so you're not going to wear gloves. You know, you, if, if you, let's say you're going to the grocery store, right? when I go, or I'm just going to talk about it. Like when I go into the hospital, I go into the hospital, I open the doors with my hands because that's the only way I get in to where my mask is. And I wash my hands, I'll put my mask on, go out. There's no gloves in that room. So I go out and I, and I <laughs> open the door and then I wash my hands again when I have to, t anytime I have to touch something. And then when I have to go into a patient room or for the rest of the time where there are gloves on the floor, I'm wearing two, wear two, two uh, pairs of gloves. I have my N95. Uh, I have a hat on my head and I'm wearing a gown and that's to interact with COVID patients. And what I would do in a grocery store is I would have gloves in the car that I put on as I leave my car. And then I would go in to the hospital, uh, to the grocery store, put my stuff in the thing. And then as I was checking out, putting my stuff before I put my stuff in the car, I would, I would then probably remove the gloves, but it, there's no guarantee. I mean, you still got to clean everything, you know, and then you got to take your clothes off when you get home and then you got to put them in a bag and go, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. The hypervigilance is exhausting. Does anyone agree with that? Yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot of hand washing. And, and so what about supplements? What supplements would you tell your friend or family member? <laughs> Yeah, vitamin C, I would say, you know, a thousand milligrams a couple times a day, um, you know, over the counter zinc a couple times a day, and uh, vitamin D, because we're not outside as much, you know. Um, and mm -hmm. almost everybody needs vitamin D. Vitamin, you know, lack of vitamin D can be a, um, yeah. is, can be a, a factor in a lot of, a lot of diseases. And we know the importance of calcium uh, regulation in terms of, you know, like a channel signaling for our muscles and stuff like that. And of course. Heart. Yeah. And, and magnesium, I mean, a magnesium is a, is a supplement I think that is often overlooked. Um, mm -hmm. And especially if you're having a lot of, um, I mean, this has nothing to do with COVID, but just in terms of regular health, if you're having a lot of um, muscle cramps, then 
magnesium and, and to a lesser degree potassium, but mostly magnesium. We, we don't like to supplement with past potassium too much because that can cause uh, heart uh, problems, ele electric, <laughs> electrical abnormalities. So be careful with potassium. Just eat a so banana here and there. Last time we talked, we you said it's real. The whole uh, trailers, the refrigerated uh, trucks out back. Mm -hmm. um, what's the status on those? Are they getting filled up? Are they being moved? Well, Do you know? Yeah, I don't. I I mean, I'm not involved with the morgue, so you know, I don't. I don't see that. I know that Elmhurst Hospital, you know, was still having had a lot of people, you know, that were passing away, and they the morgue was full. Um, you know, we were having a lot of, of deaths at our hospital and our morgue is pretty small. So oh. it's, you know, I mean, they have to do something with those bodies. So they, they do, you know if, it. do you know if the coronavirus is still alive on the bodies, on the, on the corpses or what's the status on that? Um, I don't, when you look at the studies that, you know, especially like from the, the cruise ships where, you know, it, it was staying alive on surfaces for up to 17 days. Um, I think that the default is that it's probably still alive and it's alive in the body fluids and it's alive in any, any, you know, expelled gas. I mean, we've seen that it's alive in feces. It is, you know, so it's, I mean, it's a pre pretty freaking robust virus. Okay. Let's talk about that because there was a warning put out about feces and, and fecal transplants. So the yeah. thought originally was that you drink water and it rushes and it pushes this virus down to your stomach acids and the stomach acids would kill it. But somehow it's making its way through the GI tract. Is, is that is my thinking off or is that? Uh, no, it is. It's, I mean, it's just a robust virus. It's figured out a way to survive in our, in our system, you know, or to, but to infect us. And stuff in the stomach. It's, it's, yeah. It's, how else is it going? How is this getting from the respiratory tract into our fecal? Uh, well, unless, unless oh. it's coming, you know, unless it's on the skin, you know, unless it's on the skin and it's, it's coming, but I don't, I actually don't know. It could be, I mean, really I like there is that. that or you'd have to well, walk around. Yeah. Something. Yeah. It could be, you know, fecal oral, you know, I mean, we, we know it's a respiratory virus, but, but think about yeah. it this way. Um, yeah, if, if you butt. have, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what it, like a four year old will do. Right. So it's, it's right. not something that adults will normally do. So I, I'm thinking that if you have, <laughs> if I'm, I, I'm thinking that if you have um, translocation mm -hmm. uh, and if you are infected and things, you know, who knows? I mean, it could, it could help force some sort of a leaky gut. It could, you know, you can get translocation into the gut. I mean, I don't know. I, I really don't. It, and the mechanism of action is going to be fascinating when we find it out. By that, by translocation, you mean that it's in our bloodstream when we're really yeah. sick and it's made its way through the GI tract, uh, through the cells into our tools. Yeah. And it may not require a cytokine storm for that, but it, it does cause inflammation. I think if, if I think that the people who have an underlying, you know, inflammation are a little bit more uh, at risk. And so that, you know, goes back to, you know, the proper diet, which is, I know, something that you teach and, um, you know, getting, so, getting rid of like boxed food. It's not food. I know it's not your area of specialty uh, and it's kind of morbid, but, um, do you think like we're going to have mass burials? Like is the, the opportunity for people to, to have a single funeral to bury their grandmother, is that out the window? Are we going to have um, mass burials? Well, no, I think they're, I think they're actually cremating the bodies. We talked about this the last time. And I think, I think that these COVID bodies are being cremated um, and they're doing like, you know, zoom meetings or FaceTime or something for their, for their funerals. Oh. But I haven't called. I haven't called the funeral home to find out. I mean, it's just you know. So let me ask you another question. This is kind of sad too. So, if we think the virus is staying alive for seventeen days on these corpses, that means like organ donations are going to go away for a while. Yeah, I don't think that. Uh, you know, I haven't seen anything about organ donation. I mean, these patients are all infected with something that we don't know how to treat, and yeah. so we can't we can't use these these people. And, and I mean, we are, you know, we are testing, um, we're testing pe patients that come in through the ER, they're all getting tested for COVID now. And, um, you know, I think I said the last time, you know, we, we had an op we did an operation, the lady was negative. And so we were happy about that, but we just, you know, a couple of days ago, just had to operate on a guy who was really sick. 
um, and also had COVID. So. Wow. So when do you think that we'll get back to being able to do elective surgeries? Because in, in Trump's plan, rollout plan, he does talk about phase two, phase three, where you can start doing elective surgeries again. Do you feel comfortable with that? Or, or what, what's your criteria with that? Um, I mean, I think, I think that, that in order to kind of get people back from their furloughs. I mean, I mean, think about what's happened, you know, it's, it, it would just talk about, just talk about the economics of healthcare. Just, you know, mm -hmm. we, we've got um, operations, elective operations are the lifeblood of a hospital in terms of finances. Um, and you know, this as a bariatric surgeon, you know, I mean, you, you brought in a ton of money for the hospital. And when you're able to do, you know, 10 cases a day and just bounce from room to room, I mean, or 10 or 20, maybe, um, that's, that's great. Right. And, um, and that the more patients you can do, I mean, it's just like a factory, the more you can do the, and, and I'm sorry to, you know, we don't look at people as factories, but, uh, when you're looking at corporate medicine, it's like a factory, it's the same, it's the same analogy. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not cheapening people's lives. What I'm saying is that it's just like a factory in, in how we run it. Um, so when the hospital is not getting that work. Oh, now you have frozen on me. Ah, there we go. Awesome. Um, so when the hospitals, yeah, am I, are we back? Yeah, are we back? back. Okay. So when the hospital is not getting that work, they, they don't have money. And so they furloughed a whole bunch of people. Uh, we're, you know, we've got all the OR staff who aren't working. And, and so it's a long way to say that, um, you know, if we're going to get the economy rolling, um, one of the things we need to do is start doing elective surgery again. We do. And there are hospitals that are closing down. And, and like you said, hospitals provide a lot of jo good, high paying jobs for a community. And, uh, and it's one of the major employers of a community is their local hospital. So some yeah. of these little local hospitals are closing down because they just can't afford to keep this shut down. Maybe they're in a small area that doesn't have a lot of uh, COVID cases and they're really getting wiped out. So yeah, it's problematic. Yeah. And, and so, so, you know, and, and then we have like a lot of doctors um, who are having to take a pay cut because, you know, 20 to 30% yeah. pay cut just because there, there's no work. You know, we have, we have doctors who can't see patients in their office because, you know, uh, and, and some people have started to take patients, but they're checking people for, for a fever. And when you say, okay, so I'm going to have you in my office and I'm going to check you for fever, but you've got Corona and you're not symptomatic yet. And now we're, we're, you know, we've got 17 days of this Corona living on the surfaces. And, and so it's, it is a conundrum. It's a huge conundrum. What do you, what do you think about the future of telemedicine? Cause I, I see it as like people are getting used to zooms. They're getting used mm -hmm. to live. And so, I think there's a huge opportunity there for to streamline the doctor's office to, to do telemedicine and you could handle a lot to stay on track. So patients don't have to sit in the waiting room. I think it's a huge, yeah. no, uh, listen, I think, I think what's happening is we're, we're in a place where we have globally reset. A lot of industries do not need people to come to work. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even in my office, even in my surgical office, I have, you know, I, and I've had this for years. I've had somebody who works in Florida from Florida. She always did stuff from Florida. I have another guy who's up in uh, the, you know, up in the Northeast in, in New Hampshire um, or Maine, but way up there. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, at the end, and I had somebody in California for a long time. So, I mean, at the end of the day, when, when you have the ability to connect through a local hub, and meet and you know make things happen I, you know why were, are we making people to go in why mm -hmm. and and so you know i mean i've had i had three conferences cancel in the last month mm -hmm. and all three of them were done virtually and really and the, what do i miss i miss networking with people i miss i miss interacting with with people you yeah. know i i don't i'm kind of an introvert and i and i kind of you know stick to my own thing in in a lot of ways and what I love about going to a conference is meeting new people and making it, you know, making, you know, usually I'll make one friend at each conference. Yeah. But Dr. Gordon, I want to take some viewer questions here in a second. So everybody okay. watching right 
for now. I mean, if you found massive value of this, please hit share for us to, to get, uh, we got 1700 people watching. We can get that over 2000. Just hit shares right now. Uh, great. Um, and and um, we're going to get your questions ready. So go ahead and get your questions ready to, to put in. I'll put you up on the screen. But Dr. Gordon is really, her, her love, passion is really hormones, hormones and helping people with menopause, menopause yeah. movement. You talk about what you're doing real quickly while people are hitting share so we can yeah. get you well, so I have the the Menopause Movement podcast, and that's on um, that's on Apple or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. It's all over the place, and so mm -hmm. you can you can go to that. We've got like um, I don't know, we're we're approaching fifty episodes, and so we've got a couple really great things coming up. We this week um, or next week? This week we just we just released yesterday um or the day before release menopause yoga with petra Coveney. and then next week we have you know start your online business now <laughs> because i figured that well for 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 anyone who is you know stuck at home or is for I mean, we have the most uh unemployment claims in our country in the history of the country I and mean, we have the most people that are unemployed and wow. so uh, if you want to start a business, if you want to, if you were been thinking about starting a business, then, you know, next week that we're going to be releasing that. And then I have another one was like how different Enneagram types are responding to the, to the, uh, to the, to the thing. So, so that's, that's one, you know, so there's, there's a, quite a few really great things coming up in the podcast. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And then the other thing is, is that I've got a, a, a free two week course that's coming up. For, but it's only for women, guys. It's okay. not for the not for the men. How much that, are you? How much, is it? How much is it? It's free. Free. It's free. All you have to do is fill out an application, and it's it's free in exchange for uh, testimonials and feedback. Oh. And so course? all you, it's it's on managing your menopause, and awesome. and How understanding your hormones. <laughs> so all you have to do is go to bit.ly forward slash minnow beta. Okay, let me type this, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash. Minnow beta, minnow lowercase. Beta. Uh oh, all right, excellent. Don't okay. break it. <laughs> Let's, let's take some and, questions and, here. And if awesome. you, you just have to go through the application process and then we'll get you in. Melissa Kaiser wants to know how mm -hmm. it when it's been two weeks since symptoms. Well, I think the antibody test will be at uh, two weeks since symptoms, the antibody test will be accurate. I don't know about the nasal test. I think, you know, again, it's only 70% accurate. So, um, you know, you got to have two negative tests before you can go back to work and stuff and you got to be free of symptoms. So we got a medical question. Uh, yeah. If I have latent clotting disorders, is it a high risk factor? Um, yeah, it actually probably is because you're already, uh, clotting, but, um, if you're on Coumadin, it may, it may help. But I, again, I don't know that we don't know the mechanism of action yet of the clotting disorder. And so we don't know what it's, what's causing that. So we can't, we can't really say whether it's Coumadin or not. Mr. Simon, uh, the hospital of reinfection. Mm. Yeah. You know, I think, I think that, I think that it's a possibility um, because of the common cold and the only way we're going to work, time is going to tell. Um, we should be seeing some information out of China by now. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't know if it's accurate data or not. I mean, they just up, they just up the, the number of people that were, were sick in uh, Hubei province. What? Uh, China lying about their number? No. You think? Oh, no, not really. My co-worker wants to know, I work for, mm. what is our future? Well, up there all up in the grill, doctor. Coronavirus. Yeah. Um, ready, everybody? You know what I think? I mean, I think that, I mean, the dent, dentist, dentists are really at risk. And, um, and anyone who's, you know, I mean, I think it's going to be N95 or, or those respirators with the, you know, uh, that's going to be working with those. And that, I mean, that My girlfriend just got braces right before this happened. And so she's freaking out because she, she can't see her orthodontist. Oh, she doesn't have Invisalign? No. Oh. I talked to her about that. Good. Angela wants to know nebulizer being voided. And I'm seeing MDIs used eight puffs every four hours. Is that big? Ooh, that's a lot. Wow. That's a lot. It depends on what kind of MDI, but I'll tell you, that's, that's really a question for a pulmonologist. I mean, if you're using albuterol eight puffs every four hours, you really have to watch for like some arrhythmias and, yeah. you know, ugh. Oh, that's tough. yeah. 
That seems like a high to me. Kirsten Shaw wants to know, do you have patients who experience metallic taste in their mouth? Well, the patients I see are really, really sick and not awake. So I haven't asked that question. <laughs> well, we know it, it, if the virus seems to affect your sense of taste and sense of smell, which is taste connected to smell for sure. Yeah. Oh, Timothy wants to know how many strains are we up to now? I don't know. I, know I don't have that answer. There's there's like two main strains, right? L and S, I think, and then there's yeah. variants off. Of I it. mean, it's just it. I mean, I know it was it was mutating every two weeks. So here's a good question for a surgeon: How effective yeah. are surgical masks? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> how are? Well, let me tell you. When I operate, it's uh the last operation I did was an N95, and uh yeah. and and then a mask, and then another mask with a face shield. Wow. Um, yeah, so it's hot. And these, two hats. What about people making these homemade masks and going out to um, stores? What do you think of those masks? Uh, well, I think if you're making a mask with a HEPA filter, you're probably okay. If you're making a mask with anything else, um, it's not going to really help that much. I agree. I agree. Hey, if you guys yeah. are enjoying this Q&A, please hit share for me. That'd be awesome. Here's a good one from Canada. Cindy wants to know, what about our loved ones who are vaping and COVID? Vaping, well, risk factor? Vape, well, anything that's going to cause more inflammation in your body, I think, is a risk factor. And so, you know, vaping, I mean, if you're going to smoke, you're going to, you know, do things like that are going to cause more inflammation, then you're going to be more more at risk. Mm -hmm. What about marijuana smoking? Uh, same thing. Mar I mean, marijuana is, is a, you know, it's toxic. It causes inflammation in our bodies. The if you're smoking it now, there's there's benefits of CBD. As a matter of fact, I've got a whole podcast on that. But mm -hmm. if you, um, uh, you know, and and there's ways to take CBD that that will help, you know, edible to sleep. And yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Not that I. I mean, I mean, I don't. Marijuana makes me paranoid. I don't like it. Uh, but I've used CBD. Um, I find that I get really sleepy when I use it. Um, but it, it helps some people. Yeah, yeah, good question. That's a great question. Here's a good question. And I don't have the answer, but Diamox, you know, we use it in altitude sickness, and um, I don't know if there's any studies. That. I hope that they come out. We talked about that uh, that yeah. sickness thing, and uh, I I don't I don't know I don't know. Yeah. Oh, oh hold on. I got. How about this? Meditative your stress journal. I'm glad you're very healthy at this time. I agree with Abs that. Oh, me too. Yeah, meditate every day, a couple times a day. I journal every single morning. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, this is my journal. You probably can see it. Okay. I bought this in Santiago. Isn't beautiful. it beautiful? Yeah. Yeah. So every morning it's sitting right there. The vacuum filters work in masks. Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Unknown future forecast. Best discipline hygiene practices will stand above all else. Yeah. I think so. I agree with that. Yeah. From Desivere. That's good. I, I think that's the one that, that is that is showing the most promise right now mm -hmm. is from Desivere. Here's a good question here. Where can I, where can you uh, asthma and take allergy shots? Um, am I at high risk? Allergies is so confusing when people mm. have allergies because a lot of people don't realize I, I have allergies too, but you can get like fevers from. Did I freeze on you? Oh yeah, that's okay. How you can tell? How can you tell the difference between allergies and COVID? Um. Well, I think I think COVID is. I I don't know that you really can. I mean, right now is allergy season, and so I I, I don't, you know, if you're gonna if you get more sick, then you may, you know. Um, I don't have the answer. This is a good question about what happens after you survive a COVID infection. Is there any lung damage? Well, there may be. I mean, there was a pulmonologist who got it, mm -hmm. um, and he was. Stars. Yeah, he was talking about about you know coughing up necrotic lung. Oh, he froze. And so on you're. Me. Let me see. And you're gonna have. Um, he froze on me. Sorry. I'm here. It's okay. We'll just wait it out. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh, here we go. So you okay, say. Okay, I'm back. Yeah. So this this doctor this. 
the doctor with uh, necrotic lung, and so my expectation would be that you might get some scarring, uh, oh. just like you would with, you know, you think about like a baby, right, who has um, lung disease of a newborn, of a, of a preemie, and they, they have lung problems their whole lives, oh, a lot of them. And so you may have some lung damage later. You might have some vital capacity lost. I have a patient who had H1N1 who's still on oxygen. He's a young guy too. Yeah. Oh, negative blood. What's the deal with blood? Blood. Type. I don't know. I don't think there's anything with a blood type. I'm not. I'm not one of those believers <laughs> in blood type. I I, I agree. Yeah. Um, what about? Let's ask some controversial stuff here. What What okay. do you think about? Um, let me see. What about? Um, I can't. I'm trying to find that one so I can turn it off. <laughs> Just what click it again. I know. Turn it I, up. I got, I got comments. Oh, like this. Yeah. The comments are just coming. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think about, is this a last time we both agreed that this wasn't a bio warfare, uh, man-made lab thing, but now I'm not so sure, man. Some of the conspiracy theorists got my attention. What do you think now? Well, all of the studies that I've read have shown that um, it is, there's, there's nothing about it that it looks like it's anything that came from, uh, from anything but an animal that it jumped from an animal. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think it's, you know, the, the whole bit, you know, with the white house or the administration saying that they're looking into it being a bioweapon from China. I think that's this, them trying to control the narrative. I think it's just the tail wagging the dog. I, I you know, every, every pandemic has not been man-made. And so I'd like to believe that it isn't. Hey, Look at that. Wanda, we got yeah. I don't know. We like working together too. I think at the very least, I would say China probably might have deliberately misread, uh, misled us. Oh yeah. I, I think they, I think they had a, a problem probably back in November right. or maybe even October. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. We do see sometimes it's a, a, that, that it'll present with a rash. I've not seen the rash, um, but I, I did read that. about some dermatologists who talked about having a, having a rash as the, pre, as the presenting sign. Yep. That's yeah. How, oh, how long has the COVID-19 <laughs> been in the US, do you think? Well, officially since January 10th. <laughs> officially. Some people yeah. are saying I was really sick back in December and I've had, I was like yeah. locked down for two weeks. Most likely, I think that was probably influenza B, but I'm not. Really it, sure. Yeah, I mean, most likely it was flu, but you know, we, we don't know. We just don't know. Hmm. It, it, it will never know, probably. Lots of people um, releasing probable cause of death COVID nineteen last Tuesday. I'm not really sure what they're referring to. You know? So what they did was they increased the number of deaths um, based on thinking that it was a probable probable cause of of COVID nineteen. Um, and so, because we're not testing everyone. And so we're saying, we think that, you know, because of the way they died. Oh, I see. And uh, this is a really good question, Christina. Yeah, but we, know, we know that the uh, coronavirus attack attaches to the ACE receptor. ACE, the ACE2 spectrum. receptor, yeah. What about ACE inhibitors? Do those help? I, I don't think ACE inhibitors help. And I don't, and I, but they might make you a little more susceptible, but I don't know. Uh, ACE2, ACE and, ACE and ARBs, you know, the thing is, is that if you are taking an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, uh, if that's an angiotensin receptor blocker. Uh, if you're taking that, those, you already have some inflammation and some endothelial dysfunction. Um, but, it, you know, I, it's, you're asking me to give you answers to questions that we haven't studied. And so I, I just can't answer. Yeah. But it's a good question. Uh... China lab back in October. We've already answered that. Why yeah. is it long to ramp up testing for everybody? I think it's a huge, it's a huge task. I mean, what are you? Yeah, doing? we've got a country of 330 million people, and you know, we yeah. this is we didn't prepare. I mean, we knew it was coming, and we didn't prepare. What's your stance on NSAIDs and COVID nineteen? Or do you uh, well, I know that we don't like to use NSAIDs in um, asthma. And this is a problem that affects the lungs. And so I would just take that right across the board and say, you know, stay away from NSAIDs. This is a good one. What are the um, ages? Yeah, we're seeing all ages. Uh, we have, you know, some people on vents in their 40s. Uh, the people who are passing away are usually much older than that. Oh. So. so death is still higher, but anyone can get it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I mean, we don't treat pediatrics at our hospital, so I can't speak to pediatrics. If you're working in a hospital, would you wear Hi, a Terry. mask all the time? Uh, yes, I wear a mask. As soon as I walk in, I go into my, I have a box where I keep a mask, and I'm wearing a N95 mask the whole time I'm in the hospital. Mm-hmm. That's really good. Oh, how many symptomatic patients do you know that have recovered? Well, my cousin, but she wasn't in the hospital. Um, and then, you know, we've had pl- plenty of people in the community who have been tested positive and, and recovered. Um, but, you know, in terms of like somebody who was on the ventilator and got off, I know of one. Mm-hmm. But that's just my patients. So, so I, you know, I don't, I don't take care of all the patients in the hospital. So, uh, you know, don't take my experience as... You know, I, these are patients that I've like put lines in and seen stuff. You, you've come up, we're, we're nearing an hour and you've been very generous yeah. with your time. And I know you probably Thank got you. to get back to work, but I, you know, we'll end it with a controversial one. You love the controversy. I do. Bill Gates. What do you, uh, did he do this on purpose? Did he create it? Is he, is he profiting from a, uh, from a stuff in the vaccine? And well, I, yeah. listen, I don't watch the news, so I need you to tell me what you're, what you're talking about when it comes to Bill Gates. I don't watch the news either, but that's, <laughs> you're saying how uh, Bill Gates like predicted this, uh, did a TED Talk five, six years ago about a pandemic, and now here it is. And, and well, uh, he's he's uh, forcing people to have a vaccine, and he owns the company that's going to make the testing and the vaccination. And all sorts well, I don't know what the truth is there. I mean, I know that Bill Gates has a foundation. My brother used to work for it, and you know their their problem is malaria, and they're trying to fix malaria. Mm-hmm. Whether Bill Gates is profiting off off of the pandemic, I mean, listen, there's a lot of a lot of companies are profiting off the pandemic. Zoom is one of them. StreamYard is another, <laughs> you know, so I, I mean, I don't have anything against anyone profiting ever. I, I just don't. And and so if Bill Gates makes a profit, good for him. If he loses money, good for him. I, I it, that That isn't an issue to me. The bigger issue for me is we've known another pandemic is coming for a long time. Long time. This isn't, and, 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 and we, you know, Obama back in 2015, had a speech about it. And he said, you know, we need to make sure that we're ready because we, we think this is going to happen in the next five or seven years. And then when the Trump administration came in, they just kind of ignored that a directive, that that whole initiative on the Obama side. But if, and, and if you listen to Trump, he acts like he inherited this bare cupboard, like no ammunitions, no, no ventilators, no nothing. <laughs> Not to not he, to get like re, re, yeah no listen I don't want to Trump bash and I don't want to Obama you know so I, I mean I I'm not going to make it you know it's no secret you watch look at my Facebook page I don't like Trump and and I've never liked Trump um, but more mostly because I think he's a bombastic fool more than anything else uh, I, I and I don't think he's credible I mean he's a he's a reality star so so that's that's the only reason I mean I think he's got some good people around him I think he's got a good policy on China so I think I think there's you know there's just a lot of things. Um, trauma, Trump. There's good things about Trump. There's bad things about Trump. The fact that he wasn't ready for this when the CDC, the WHO, everyone said something was coming, and and he kind of dismantled the whole thing. And and it maybe wasn't him. Remember, he's just the guy at the top. Right. So it may have been. You know, all when you look at how. The- you look at how the administration came together and, and how all the, you know, what they're really trying to do is, is, you know, help corporations. I mean, look at, look at with the, the PPP loans, right? Who got the, yeah, Ruth's Chris got 20 million bucks, right? <laughs> but they employ a lot of people. Don't be, don't be, well, but it's supposed to be for, for companies less than 500 people. I know. I get it. I get yeah. It. You know, so. Okay, and, I like, uh, you know, when we were training, I mean, we respected organizations like the CDC and the World Health Organization. Mm-hmm. Donald Trump has defunded the World Health Organization because we give them $600 million a year versus China, who gives them $40, $50 million a year. And he says they're a wag, they're a parrot of uh, China. They do whatever China wants to say, and that's unfair. So, do you believe any of the data now from World Health Organization and the CDC? Do you think they've lost their credibility or where do you stand on that? You know, listen, I, I think that that with Trump, what what has come is that is that we don't know where what's true. It's been it's been a whole series of misinformation and and we don't know what's true. 
mm. where. And so, uh, you know, I just stay out of it. And, and it's, I mean, it's really hard. I mean, That's a you know, forward. are you going to trust the data coming out from the, the I mean, I trust the CDC. I don't, I, you know, I don't know about the WHO. I, I don't really pay attention. I mean, I've never had to pay attention to it before. Yeah, I'm a surgeon. I'm a community surgeon. I take care of gallbladders and hernias and, and appendixes, you know, I mean, that's, that's like been my, my bread and butter. And so to come in and have to take care of this is very, very different. And, uh, you know, frankly, these are not things that, you know, I mean, you, you know, before, before you, you know, before this happened, I mean, were you really looking at the WHO when you were, uh, when you were doing bariatrics? <laughs> well, only their obesity related kind of reports. Yeah. Uh, as, whenever I had to talk about like how it's a global issue uh but no i usually stayed with my own professional organization yeah. yeah yeah so, yeah. so I, I mean it's so it's it's you know what who do we trust I, you know i i don't know i mean i just think that that's that's been the whole mission of this of this administration is to you know kind of spread misinformation and we don't know who who to trust and that's that's really mm -hmm. frustrating so what what are so your biggest lessons learned if we if we face another pandemic like this in the future what are you going to do differently or what, 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 you what would i do differently i don't know that i would do anything differently i mean i hunkered down right away i ran you know ran up to cape cod to get my son and he's been here he's going to have his birthday here mm -hmm. instead of you know being able to be with his friends and stuff so um i i uh, I think the only, the one thing that I would say as a medical professional is I you know I mean I probably stay out of medicine so I don't have to go into it. <laughs> you know, I mean it's it, this is scary. I mean the doctors and nurses and and phlebotomists and respiratory therapists and you know I mean people are dying. Yeah. Because of this and people, you know, and 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 what what is really interesting is when is is that I'm, I'm getting comments that are like, thank you for your service, but I, I'm not in the military. I am not obligated to do this. This mm. is just a career choice, you know? And so when people say thank you for your service, it's like, well, you know, it, it, it it's, it's a little bit off putting because I'm not in the military and, you know, so that, that's, though, no, I, mean, I do. I do. I, I do appreciate it because it, it's a lot better right. than getting spat upon for, you know, maybe carrying the virus around which right. which is also happening that's something else that's happening so yeah i think that's weird too when there are people who and, and not doctors i never wore scrubs out in public and most of the time now people who wear scrubs out in public are our, our reps our drug reps product yeah. rep um assistant and they're not yeah. even really doctors that are wearing scrubs out in public anymore do you wear scrubs out in public i do i mean i but i have like my own branded scrubs so oh. you know I'll, I'll wear them. I'll wear them out. Although I don't like to wear it. Like, like I'll wear them from my home and then yeah. change in the hospital. Um, but it, it, I don't like to like go out, out, you know, like I feel gross if I'm wearing like scrubs in a restaurant or something. Yeah. But I think, you know, fear makes people act strange. You know, yes. I think, and I, I think they're attacking people in scrubs just because at the time they were really, really afraid. I think I think that you know people are dying and and people are afraid and I I I think that makes sense but I don't think it makes sense to attack people in scrubs who are trying to help you know save your life. Yeah, oh. that's a lot like um, back in the seventies. You know, I'm from Vietnam and product of Vietnam War. But when the Vietnam veterans came home, they got spat on and called names and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember that. It really affected a whole generation of the military. Um, yeah. Very good life of time. So I'd like to see us kind of unify more as a country and put politics aside, put religion aside, put criticism aside and just say, hey, listen, we've got problems in our infrastructure. We have problems in our medicine delivery. And I don't want to talk even get into like 80 China, 80 percent of our medicines come from China. Mm. Uh, all of our products come from China. But I think it's this is a great time. We can we have the choice right now to either rally together as a country or let this shit tear us apart. Yeah. And, and you know, it's going to depend on on, you know, listen, it's coming from the top. Right. We're going to follow the leader. 
Mm-hmm. And so if the leader says we need to rally together as a country, then we're going to probably do that. And if the leader doesn't, and you know, the, the whole thing is like, where's Biden in all of this? <laughs> it's like, it's like where, <laughs> he's like disappeared off the face of the earth. That's what I you know? There's no way he's going to win. No, and, and and it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't care. I, I really don't. I mean, I'm just going to do my thing, and and you know that's it. And you know, my 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 goal is to help as many women, you know, make menopause their best time in their lives as I can. Well, that's a, on that note, man. <laughs> Lord, I could take this opportunity to just honor you and all your Thank all you. your service, all your hard work. And <laughs> Thank you. Up out there on the front lines. Taking yeah. care of the sickest, sickest COVID patients who are in the ICU who need lines and 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 operations and everything and putting yourself in yeah. harm's way and give and sharing it with us your insights. So uh, I'd love to have this opportunity for you to just say what you're working on, your projects, how people can help yeah. support you, and especially your two week uh, free course where you're going to help people with menopause. Can you kind of, yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to be giving uh, it's a, it's a beta course. So you get kind of going to build it with me and it's just, a, it's just like a, a first week is about hormones. Second week is about managing your menopause. And we're going to do a couple of uh, group coaching calls each week. So you get a lot of interaction with me and all you have to do is uh, to apply is go to bit.ly forward slash minnow beta. M E N O B E T A. And what, and, and all you have to do, I mean, it's a $2,000 course, but we're going to, we're giving it to you for free in exchange for your feedback and testimonial. It's $2, true. Course. I'm doing $19 a month. Yeah, $2,000 <laughs> course. Yeah. It's, it's, wow. it's going to be intense. And so, um, you know, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be opening the Facebook group on, on next Friday. And, um, yeah, we're starting the course on the 27th. So if you want to get in, we're going to limit it to, you know, just a few hundred people. So make sure you get your application in. Yes. And, and for your level of expertise, that's, that's amazing. amazing. Yeah. I'm really excited about delivering this course. It's going to be really, really fun. And it starts when next Friday, but it's going to, we're going to open up the face. So you're going to be waiting in the Facebook group. Probably if you're approved, you'll be waiting in the Facebook group uh, until Friday next week. And then, um, and then we're going to start the course on the 27th. On the 27th, but apply now. Yeah. But apl- Oh yeah. Apply now to secure your spot and make sure that, you know, we have to review your application, but yeah. yeah. And only about 150 slots, right? So, a few hundred. We'll do a few hundred. We'll see. We'll see how many, you know, depends. Up on me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> are we for, are we still frozen? Yeah, no, I got you now. Okay, yeah, you know, I mean, we'll see. It, it we're gonna see how many how many people come in, but yeah, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna give you a great experience, that's for sure. And you're gonna someone asked, are you gonna cover hot flashes and all that sort of stuff? Too? We're gonna talk about symptoms and symptom management. We're gonna talk about hormones, and yeah, that's the that's the whole idea is like understanding your hormones and managing your symptoms and understanding you know menopause. That's the whole idea. Someone, someone asked uh, earlier, um, what if it's a male doctor who wants to learn about hormones? Could they get in? Um, this course is for women. And the reason I only let women in is that women want to only talk about women about this. There's still a big stigma around menopause. And menopause, um, it's like a secret society that no one wants to talk about. And so we want to give people a safe place to talk about it. And so well, we keep it private. Maybe in the future, you and I can work together on male menopause. Uh, manopause. Manopause. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Manopause, andropause. Yeah, the loss of testosterone uh, with age. Although I'm, I'm not as much of an expert in that as I am in menopause, having gone through it myself. Are uh, you awesome. froze? Yeah. Oh, I'm good now. All You're right, give better. That one more time, and then I'll let you go, Doc. All right. Well, you got another question or no? No, just I want you to throw your. Oh. Yeah. So um, it, can you put it in a comment and put it up on the screen? It's, uh, it's bit.ly forward slash minnow beta, M-E-N-O-B-E-T-A. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Doc. Thank All you. Right. So much. It was great having Thanks you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, for coming 